Hello class, this is a recording of our lecture from October 26, uh, where we begin to talk about the molecular underpinnings of the circadian clock. Uh, so this got started in a paper from 19, published in 1971 by Ron Kanopka and Seymour Binzer, uh, and they found the first evidence for uh, a gene that controls uh, the circadian rhythm. Both, uh, it had an effect on uh, eclosion, uh, which is the uh, development of uh, pupa into adult insects, uh, and so they found this in fruit flies, uh, and then also locomotor behavior of individual fruit flies. Uh, and so what they did was they exposed uh, Drosophila uh, individuals to a mutagen, ethyl methane sulfonate, uh, and this is a chemical that induces point mutations uh, in the genome uh, in, at, at random. And so what they did was they exposed um, right, hundreds, uh, hundreds of individuals to this, uh, flies with um, all kinds of different mutations, and what they did was they, they just simply recorded and looked for disruptions of the circadian rhythm. And then once they found them, they would figure out where the mutations were right, to get a good idea of what genes, uh, what gene disruption corresponded with the disruption in their circadian output. And so they discovered three different uh, mutant phenotypes uh, that they ultimately called per L, per S, and per zero. Uh, per L, which stand for uh, period long, or individuals that showed a circadian, uh, a period of circadian rhythm of 28 hours. Per S, period short, a 19 hour period, and then arrhythmic individuals are per zero. So let's take a look at some of the data here. From their paper, first we're taking a look at uh, the eclosion data. So the top graph, the top graphs are just copies uh, of the same thing from left to right, of the normal phenotypes that were not exposed to the mutagen. And you can see a, a rhythmic peak of eclosion, eclosion development in the fruit fly. And I've highlighted them here with red lines. And you can clearly see compared to per zero, um, they have no a rhythmic pulse in their eclosion, like you see in the normal. With per S, we see here that uh, taking a look at the top individuals, the, the time that it takes for them to reach their, their fourth peak of eclosion, which is the fourth day, um, the, uh, the per S individuals that have a short period, uh, they have already uh, had their four peaks before this. So it takes less time for them to go through four cycles compared to the normal or uh, wild type, as we more appropriately call them, uh, the wild type individuals that have no, no mutation. And as for per L, uh, when the wild type reaches four cycles, per L um, appears to be uh, about another full cycle away. So they've only had uh, three peak eclosion events uh, over the course of uh, 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 four days, whereas the wild type have had four. And another way to visualize the same data uh, from the, the same paper here, we have actograms. So this is a uh, data of uh, individual locomotor behavior uh, and what they've done here, typically what we see um, in actograms is the x-axis is 24 hours, but what they've done here is they've, they've, they've changed the x-axis to fit the period length. And so you don't get a lot of, uh, you don't get, um, you know, as before, you could look at an actogram and tell if, if an individual has a drastically delayed or advanced uh, behavior, uh, rhythm, by the, the slanting 
uh, how severely slanted the actogram is. But here, they've, they've stretched it out, so it's even more apparent. And so the wild type on the, type, on the top, uh, the arrhythmic, uh, the point here is not that the, uh, the period length has changed, it's just there, there, there essentially is no period. There's, the, the, the black marks are randomly allocated uh, throughout the, the period. Uh, per S has a much shorter period length, so that's why uh, the x-axis is much shorter. It's only 19 hours. And per L has a 28-hour period. And you can see that the actograms really fit nicely uh, into this, uh, uh, to these periods. And these, of course, are, are double-plotted. That's why you're seeing two distinct uh, periods of activity during this, uh, uh, across the entire x-axis. So that was the very first uh, demonstration of one gene uh, that could change the uh, period length uh, in, in different ways, too, depending on how the gene was affected. And what we find uh, over time, what we have found, is that the molecular clock is made up of many different genes. Uh, and in fact, the molecular clock has been discovered to be uh, what we call transcription translation feedback loops. And it's composed of multiple loops. Um, as we'll see, uh, primary loops, secondary loops, and tertiary loops of this uh, molecular process of transcription and translation. So let's uh, go over that a little bit. So we're all on the same page of what transcription and translation is. So transcription and translation is the process by which um, DNA is ultimately um, used to produce uh, proteins. From DNA, it is transcribed into RNA, specifically messenger RNA. So it's a, a kind of like a, a carbon copy, not exactly, because it's a what we call a, a complement uh, copy of, of a specific strand, um, a specific strand of DNA. Uh, and that messenger RNA, with the help of molecular machinery, uh, is used as a, uh, a code in which to build uh, proteins, one amino acid at a time. And then those proteins go off to do a myriad of different functions uh, in our cells uh, and between cells. Uh, so let's take a closer look at this process step by step. Divide it up into these two general categories, transcription, going from DNA to messenger RNA, and translation, using the messenger RNA to produce proteins, our little cellular machines. So starting with uh, DNA, DNA can be uh, described, can be uh, categorized into two main areas when it comes to, when you think about it uh, in terms of transcription. There are regions of the DNA that are coding, coding regions as we call them, uh, and these are the ones that will be uh, used to create the messenger RNA. There's some DNA that does not get used uh, as a template to make RNA. Uh, and we call these, uh, much of, of these areas act as promoter or regulatory regions. And so these um, promoter regions consist of sequences of bases to which proteins uh, called transcriptional regulators uh, or transcription factors, which is the, the term that I'll use, uh, uh, um, to which they bind. And so transcription factors bind to promoter regions of DNA. Uh, many of the trans transcription factors have a uh, DNA binding domain. So they have a specific three-dimensional feature in their structure 
that allows them to bind to DNA. One of the common ones, one of these common motifs, is called the basic helix loop helix, which just describes the shape of the protein itself. Uh, and this will become important later when uh, we take a look at the, the sort of searching for the further details of the molecular clock. Um, and it acts to switch on or off the coding region of a gene uh, to initiate transcription. So transcription factors can turn on a gene or it can turn off a gene. So let's see uh, how it does that. So transcription factors, which I have here labeled as a uh, pink uh, parallelogram, um, they bind to a promoter region of a gene. And the way that this initiates or facilitates transcription of the DNA is through another special protein called RNA polymerase. So a transcription factor uh, uh, activator, so this transcription factor we're going to call an activator, which is just a, des a description of its function it allows RNA polymerase to bind to the DNA. RNA polymerase on its own can't do this. It needs the help of this transcription factor activator in order to do that. But once it has bound, it can move along the DNA strand and it synthesizes messenger RNA um, based on the specific code that it finds as it's moving along the DNA strand. It finds the complement nucleic acids uh, and builds a, a single-stranded mRNA uh, uh, piece. And it continues along growing the mRNA strand larger and larger until uh, it's complete and done coding uh, the coding region of the single-stranded DNA. Uh, so a little bit uh, lost here with this graphic here. Um, RNA, RNA polymerase codes for just a single strand of the DNA. Here the DNA is visualized as a double helix, but actually what it does is it sort of breaks up uh, the two different strands and only codes for uh, one of the strands, sort of like unzipping uh, a zipper. Now, uh, transcription factors can also act as rep repressors. And so by binding of a transcription factor, it may uh, deny, uh, prevent RNA polymerase from binding. All right, so it ensures that um, another transcription factor that might be an activator can't bind here and allow RNA polymerase. So in this instance, this transcription factor is a, uh, uh, it's a repressor. Uh, it's an off switch, or it's preventing, preventing the on switch from binding. And so this gene will never get expressed. It won't get transcribed, uh, and the ultimate proteins that it encodes won't get made. So in this way, trans these repressors and activators are on and off switches for genes, dictating what gets turned on uh, and uh, when it gets turned on and for how long. Now on to uh, thinking about translation. Once we've made our m mRNA strand and the transcription process is done, the mRNA, um, it actually is a little bit more detailed. It uh, may go through uh, a few other steps here where the mRNA might be uh, uh, modified slightly, uh, sort of get trimmed up a bit, but we don't need to know that level of detail. But the mRNA will eventually make its way out of the nucleus. 
and now the mRNA is in the cytoplasm, has left the nucleus. And let's take a closer look at this strand. So now we have our RNA strand at the bottom, a little closer look. We can actually see the individual uh, nitrogenous bases that the letters represent. Uh, and the unique sequence of these nitrogenous bases is what gives rise to our polypeptide or protein that will eventually be made using this as a template. Uh, and it does this uh, first via uh, a little a little cellular protein called a ribosome, which attaches to the RNA. And so where does it know? How does it know where to attach? It attaches to a specific three, uh, three nitrogenous base sequence, AUG, uh, which stands for the three nitrogenous bases, adenine, uracil, guanine. Uh, and then the, the, the fourth nitrogenous base, C, uh, is cysteine. Uh, and a complementary strand to AUG um, would be uh, uracil, U, adenine, A, and cysteine, C. And so each nitrogen space has its uh, complement, right? adenine to uracil and guanine to um, cysteine. And so this AUG is a common start, what we call start codon. Codon being uh, three nitrogenous bases that code. Uh, so the ribosome reads the nitrogenous base code three at a time, or one codon at a time. And it starts with AUG in this example. And so what the ribosome does is it allows another specific type of RNA called transfer RNA or tRNA to bind to this codon, right? The specific tRNA that has the complementary nitrogenous basis, UAC. And so it binds, and this tRNA, uh, tRNA carries an individual amino acid. And this is how you build proteins, one amino acid at a time. Proteins are made up of multiple amino acids. And so this is the initiation phase. Ribosome binds, and our first tRNA binds to the start codon. And then translation goes through an elongation stage, which is just a repeated process of the ribosome moving up the messenger RNA to the next codon, which allows the next tRNA to bind, the one that has the appropriate complementary nitrogenous bases, because right, not just any any ordinary tRNA can bind. Right? Uh, and, and I should say that the specific um, uh, complementary codon that this tRNA has corresponds to a specific amino acid. Right? So the, the GUG codon on the RNA will always bind um, a tRNA that has the complementary uh, codon. CAC, and that CAC, a tRNA will always be bound to the same, um, the, the, the same specific amino acid. Uh, so if you ran through this multiple times, you would get the exact sequence of amino acids over and over and over again. Um, so another one, and you can see here, we've got the potential to start the protein because we have two amino acids that are close to each other. And our preceding amino acid is then transferred to the subsequent uh, amino acid. And we call this transpeptidation. So our amino acid transfers over. Uh, and then our first tRNA is released. Uh, and then elongation continues by just repeating this cycle over again. So the ribosome moves, 
uh, another tRNA uh, attaches. The now two amino acids transfers to the new amino acid, so now we have three. And that uh, tRNA without the amino acid is released. Uh, and this happens over and over and over going down the mRNA strand until it reaches a, a stop codon. Uh, in, an example of a stop codon is UGA. So when it reaches this, um, the ribosome uh, releases the polypeptide uh, and disassociates itself from the uh, RNA. And we have the specific amino acid code, the specific protein that's been made from this particular strand of mRNA, which comes from a very specific uh, stretch of DNA. So much of what we know about the molecular clock comes from this group here, Hall and Roshbash, their research laboratory, or their combined research laboratories. Um, and one of the first things that they discovered following up uh, from the discovery of the per gene or period gene uh, was that this gene, in fact, showed a, a circadian rhythm itself and its production and its transcription and translation, um, which would be presumably one of the um, prerequisites for something that, for, for, for a gene that would be a circadian, uh, the, the molecular clock. As we see that disrupting the gene leads to a disruption in the the outputs, the circadian outputs, uh, but how about the its itself? Does it show a circadian rhythm? Uh, and in fact, it does. The per gene, taking a look here at the peak production of mRNA, uh, which is the abundance on the y-axis, over the course of 24 hours, which is the x-axis, time. Um, and we see that mRNA peaks during early subjective night in Drosophila. It's, uh, and so we're taking a look at mRNA production here. Uh, and so this is a circadian rhythm in transcription, which is the process that produces mRNA. Uh, and this data here um, was extrapolated from uh, these uh, nucleic acid gels. And so you can you can run nucleic acids in an agarose gel um, exposed to a, uh, a current uh, because they are slightly charged and it'll migrate through the gel uh, faster or slower depending on its size. And so it's an easy way to visualize um, individual sequences. Right? And you can predict where they will be based on uh, how, how large or small they are. Uh, and so we have some, uh, we have a control here at the bottom, this uh, RP49, um, a few more at the top here of larger nucleic acids. And we can see here per, they have it here uh, two and three, and this is because the, the per RNA has, has been um, um, cut into two. And so we, they, they expect to see two different pieces of it. Uh, and we can see that over the course um, of a 24-hour period, they're taking samples every hour. This is what the numbers 1 through 24 indicate at the top. Uh, we can see a clear circadian rhythm. The darker the band, the more abundant the RNA is. And so we can see uh, that the per mRNA abundance uh, increases from about... Um, or it's at its highest concentrations from about 11 to 18, which corresponds to what we saw in the previous graph uh, during early subjective night. Now another paper from the same group, circadian fluctuations of period protein, immunoreactivity in the central nervous system and the visual system of Drosophila. Uh, so now they're taking a look at uh, protein, right, which is the output of translation, whereas before we were looking at mRNA, which is the output of transcription. So um, 
you would predict that if you see a circadian rhythm in mRNA production, you're probably going to find a circadian rhythm in protein production because protein is derived uh, directly from encoding RNA. And what they found was that in Drosophila, the per protein peaks about six to eight hours after the peak of its per mRNA. Uh, and one thing to note here, the general nomenclature used for genes and um, protein is that genes are italicized. Um, and you'll see, sometimes you'll see, typically it's the first letter is uh, capitalized, I believe. Uh, but sometimes you come across it and it's all uh, lowercase. Uh, and proteins, proteins are not capitalized. And they are, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> proteins are not italicized, but all the letters are capitalized. And so we'll see this. Uh, it'll be important to keep track of this, especially when we start to take a look at the complicated uh, mapping of the molecular clock. So the, the capital P-E-R protein is derived from the mRNA, which is made from the capital P lowercase e-r gene. All right. But we would pronounce it per for either. And so taking a look at the graph here, we can see that the protein is peaking six to eight hours after late uh, early subjective night, which is when the mRNA peaks. So the protein has um, um, a similar period length, right? Um, but it's it's delayed compared to the mRNA, which is what you would expect because it takes time to go through this process of turning mRNA or using it to code for uh, proteins and synthesizing proteins. So now, uh, considering this data, where we know that disrupting the per gene uh, gives us uh, funky period links or uh, no period length at all in the case of the arrhythmic phenotype. Uh, and the fact that the per gene goes through a circadian uh, rhythm in its transcription, and that the production of the per protein also goes through a circadian rhythm as well. That complementary fits what you would expect. It's delayed compared to the mRNA production. Uh, this right here um, um, is a, a hypothesis uh, that uh, Hall and Roshbash uh, came up with based on these findings of the protein. That uh, high concentrations of per protein in the nucleus overrides the activating effects of transcription factors and it inhibits its own gene. So the per protein perhaps is a repressive transcription factor that specifically represses the per gene, so it represses ultimately itself. And we call this a negative feedback, right? That the product slows down the initial steps of the reaction that leads to that product. So this reduces transcription and translation of new per protein. That existing per protein would then degrade over time enzymatically. Um, with little per protein, that inhibitory effect, that repressive effect on the transcriptional drive of the per gene, that ceases. And with the uh, inhibition gone, new mRNA can be synthesized. It can be transcribed. Uh, and you can see how this cycle will start again as per builds and then inhibits her disappears, the inhibit, inhibition disappears, and the mRNA can be synthesized again. So this negative feedback loop repeats indefinitely, taking about 24 hours for one full cycle. And this is a schematic of what it looks like. Uh, transcription and translation using the per gene, we can see that there's a uh, uh, a transcriptional regulator here that will bind to the promoter region, which allows the per mRNA to be made, goes out into the cytoplasm where it is used to make the per protein. The per protein somehow makes its way back into the nucleus where it inhibits this transcriptional regulator 
from activating the gene. The gene is inhibited. Uh, most of the per protein, the per protein starts to break down, and over time you'll have very little per protein left. Uh, and so there's not enough per protein to continue to repress the per gene. And the tr transcription regulator starts anew, making more mRNA in the next cycle. Uh, and so we're going to, um, I'm stopping this video here. And what we'll do is uh, I'll have another video that's just sort of continuous. So you know, about 30 minutes a video is, I think, enough. So you can take a break. And we'll continue to look at a little bit more of searching for the molecular clock. Um, and eventually we'll go over sort of our, the, the, uh, the, the modern blueprint of what we know about the molecular clock, which is, as we'll see, uh, a bit different from what we have here and certainly more complicated.